Good morning. On behalf of the family, I want to extend thanks to each of you for taking time to attend, either in person or virtually. Man, this yet last year has been crazy, hasn't it? Made it difficult for us to gather for events like this. This is a celebration of life service for Joyce Marie DeWitt, or Queen, as some of us knew her. Uh, just before we get started any further, just a reminder, a gentle reminder, to make sure your phones are silenced or on vibrate. That would help us out quite a bit. So make sure your phones are turned down. A few years ago, I was talking with a pastor friend who is very influential in my spiritual growth, and he shared with me a pleasant and comforting reminder that he communicates to all those uh, that gather in this way. And I want to share you with you that reminder as we begin today. And here it is. We gather today not because someone died, but because someone lived. In conversations with Leonard, Joyce made him promise that he would oversee the details of her memorial service. And Leonard has fulfilled that promise, and every detail in this service has been overseen by the watchful eye of Reverend Leonard DeWitt. And we will look forward to his meditation a little bit later on during the service. And let me just say, uh, when you are, as a pastor, when you're called upon to do a family member's service, that is the most, sometimes the most difficult service to do. So just be in prayer for, our, for Leonard. As we travel through the next hour together, allow God to meet with you and wrap his arms around you. We will sing and hear familiar songs of faith, you will feel God's heartbeat through his scriptures. You will experience the testimony of Joyce's faith in God through stories and pictures. And in the time we have together, allow God's presence to comfort you during your time of grief. You may hear many thoughts about Joyce's life. My thoughts can be summed up in scripture. About 22 verses of Proverbs 31 could be read and applied to Joyce's life. And I simply want to share just two verses. Proverbs 31, verses 30 and 31. Charm is deceitful, and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done, let her deeds publicly declare her praise. And as you can imagine, music was important to Joyce's faith and testimony. And Pastor Mike Chereau will come and lead us in singing the old rugged cross. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be a part of this memorial service today, and I know that we can honor Joyce and the Lord by singing great songs like the old rugged cross. The chorus is so appropriate till my trophies, the last I lay down, and exchange them for a crown. That's what Joyce has done. So join me as we sing the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday 
pay for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for t'was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged My trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. It shall and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a
Were those fun pictures to look at? Yes, they were. One beautiful thing I noticed about my mother-in-law was her passionate embrace of Scripture. The Word of God saturated her life, and it was evident in every aspect. Like most believers, the center of her daily worship was her Bible. As you can imagine, many scriptures were noted as being special to Joyce. So allow me to read a few of them. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 of the New King James Version. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We recognize this next passage as the Beatitudes. In Joyce's Bible, she marked the scripture as beautiful attitudes. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice in being exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Philippians, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Uh, we wanted to share with you a poem we found in Joyce's Bible. It's dated March 30th, 1964. It was written by Helen B. Asen, based on the scripture Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The poem is entitled, It's Blessed Victory. When I reach my heavenly portal, what rejoicing that will be. And I'll find the saints are gathering from across the land and sea. For we'll all be shouting glory. I'll be happy as can be. For I'll see the face of Jesus. Yes, it's blessed victory. Life is filled with cares and struggles, pressing hard at every hand. Earth can hold no sway to keep me for this great and promised land. For we'll all be shouting glory, and I'll be happy as can be. For I'll see the face of Jesus. Yes, it's blessed victory. For years I've read his promises, and I've been fed and nurtured too. Now I'm resting on these promises as I see them all come true. For we'll all be shouting glory, and I'll be happy as can be. For I'll see the face of Jesus. Yes, it's blessed victory. It's so nice to know my Jesus. He always held my hand, and death can hardly feel its pangs. 
as I near that promised land. For we'll all be shouting glory. I'll be happy as can be. For I'll see the face of Jesus. Yes, it's blessed victory. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, as we've gathered to celebrate the life of Joyce Marie DeWitt, we acknowledge you as the great creator and sustainer of life. And it was because of you that Joyce had her existence. According to Psalm 139, verse 13, you made all the delicate inner parts of her body and knit, him, knit her together in her mother's womb. Father, you know how much we dearly loved Joyce. We know that she placed her faith and trust in you. And you did a wonderful miracle in her life, nurturing her into the great woman of God that we admire. And because of her intimate relationship with you, we can gather with joyful hearts knowing she's with you now. And she's free of pain and suffering. And she's reunited with other family and friends. And we pray for the family as we continue to grieve. We thank you for meeting us in our time of need and supplying us with your peace. And we trust in the coming days that we'll lean on you for our much-needed comfort. And we pray that you will draw close to us as we draw close to you. We pray for all those who are friends of Joyce. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful relationships she had with her fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Joyce touched many lives through her gentle and tender spirit. Many here today can testify that she brought a wonderful joy to our lives. As people remember the great memories they had with her, Lord, lead them in a time of celebration as they appreciate her successful journey to be in your presence. And finally, Lord, we pray that you will help each one of us to measure our relationship with you. Joyce, at an early age, chose to follow you. And we pray that we will follow Joyce's example of faithful dedication to you and choose to enjoy a close, intimate, personal relationship with you as we live our lives in this world. Joyce rejoiced in the fact that she was redeemed. Lord, may we also be joyful in our redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mike Chereau will come and share with us a song. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died, to buy my pardon, and empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's final war 
with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know wanted to bring to you today some um, memories of my mom from other family and, um, and our family. The first is from my cousin, Carla Casperson, and she sent this message. I will always remember Joyce as a godly and loving lady. I loved our weekly chats. Joyce shared a lot of the Wall family history that I didn't know. She was a beautiful person inside and out, and what a sense of style she had. Joyce was a big blessing in my life. I love her and will miss her dearly. From our Canadian clan, Ethel DeWitt and her family, thanks for the kindnesses shown to us during our many visits to your home in good times and the challenging times. Joyce was always so gracious and hospitable to us, always making sure our needs were met. She surely will be missed, but we will meet her again in a far better land, heaven. May the Lord give you his strength and his peace. From my dad's sister, Aunt Opal, my uncle Melvin, Shadbolt, and their family, it was a great blessing when Joyce became a part of the DeWitt family, always kind and gracious and full of her faith in Jesus. She was a true sister to us and was dearly loved because of it. She has left a large vacancy in our lives, but she now has her reward with her Savior. May the Lord give his grace, comfort, and peace to all the family. And from my brother Sheldon. Just a minute. I want to take a moment to thank my mom for her life and the love she showed to our family. There was no doubt that her life exhibited God's love for friends and family. She went out of her way to make people feel welcome and accepted. Mom, I am grateful that you are in the presence of the Lord, enjoying his love and in no more pain. I love you, Mom. And we love you, Sheldon. I know you're watching. <laughs> then I wanted to share some of my own memories of Mom. And so that I could keep focused, <laughs> I wanted to use the letters of her name. Joyce Marie. J. Jesus first. In Sunday school, she taught us the joy song. Jesus and others and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you in the life of each girl and each boy. 
J is for Jesus because he has first place. O is for others we meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do. Put yourself third and spell joy. Mom lived for Jesus inside and out. O, open heart and home. I don't know if it was her spiritual gift, but mom definitely practiced hospitality. Whether it was to a couple of college kids passing through on our first Christmas in Ventura, to family and friends that God sent our way, or hosting monthly church chats, mom grandly welcomed people into our home and made them feel special. Why? Yummy cook. Now, growing up, mom did not have a lot of experience in cooking. Her mother did most of the meal preparation, and she was responsible for more of the cleaning. So when mom married dad, she faced a significant learning curve. My dad tells how someone early on gave her a Betty Crocker cookbook and that it was a good thing that Joyce could read. (laughs) She was a quick study and many times on a low budget. She could disguise hot dogs into a homestyle favorite and transform tuna into a tasty go-to casserole. C, collector. Now, blue and white was her beloved combination. We largely chalked it up to her Scandinavian heritage, but I actually think that for mom, the calm and soothing blue paired with the clean and simple white made our home the ultimate serene space or sanctuary away from a busy life with kids and ministry. What you may not know is that mom also collected collie dog figurines. Recently, my cousin Kevin reminded me that the family collie dog saved my uncle Ken, her brother, from getting run over when he was really young. My grandpa was backing up a truck on their family apple orchard that somehow my uncle got stuck under. The dog came and barked and jumped at the truck, causing my grandpa to stop and see what all the ruckus was about. Uncle Ken was spared. E, elegant. Before being a fashionista was a thing, there was my mom. (laughs) Stylish, refined, discerning, sophisticated. As our family jewel, she did earn the nickname, the queen. Even her grubbies, okay, picture yours, I know what mine are, even her grubbies were tasteful, and she always carried herself with grace. M, merry and mischievous. Hmm. Now, Mom lived up to the joy in her name. She had a beautiful smile and sparkling eyes. It was always hysterical when our usually very proper mother would get the giggles and then explode into full-blown laughter. But don't let those twinkling eyes deceive you. Mom had a little mischievous streak. I actually think it was a DeWitt defense mechanism. (laughs) Just in the last few months, as I've been organizing some things at their house, I have found five fake pet mice that my mom would occasionally hide on dad's side of the bed. (laughs) All in good fun, of course. (laughs) A, artistic. Her secret desire in high school was to paint, but she was also highly creative and, and liked to design. Clothes, for one, she sewed all of her own clothes and even remade the ones that she bought. Jewelry, flower arrangements, home decor, and more. R, role model. Mom was exemplar when it came to teaching. And as a junior hire, I was privileged to serve with her in fourth grade Sunday school class. God used her in a big way to develop my spiritual gift of teaching and direct me into Christian ministry. To this day, I use the things that she taught and modeled for me in teaching others to follow Jesus. 
I, intimate. My mom was private, but personal. Confidential, but close. I remember like it was yesterday as I sat on the bathroom floor sobbing, recovering physically from surgery for ovarian cancer, but broken emotionally and grieving loss. But because of her own health issues and a very similar surgery years earlier, mom was the one person who could understand my feelings and over the phone from 2,000 miles away, she spoke God's healing hope to my heart. E, enduring. I really don't ever remember grumbling words coming from my mom's mouth. And with 56 years of roller coaster health, humanly speaking, she might have had reason. But instead, she held on tighter to God's word than discontent. She confronted the temptation to despair with truths of God's goodness, our benefits as followers of Jesus, our eternal future, and God's sovereignty, and the joy of obedience. In her Bible, she rewrote verses like 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. In every circumstance, my mom could say and kept on saying, For this I have Jesus. I am so thankful to God for the lives, love, and legacies of my three beautiful moms. My mother-in-law, Leola Merrillett, my first mom, Barbara DeWitt, and Joyce Marie DeWitt. Now my dad's gonna come. I just want to uh, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, many of our people chose to watch it by live streaming. That was our preference so that no one would be exposed to any more sickness. I just want to mention too that on the back of your program there's a writing in remembrance of Joyce and uh, that was prepared by the Oliveras family and their remembrance of Joyce. I think it's really um, in my mind it boils down to the fact that um, it was kind of miraculous that we ever got together. I had graduated from Bible college and Barbara and I accepted a call to a, a church that had gone through a split that had been closed for a while, reopened for a year. They said, uh, we believe God wants you to come here, but we can't afford you. We can't give you a salary. 
if you accept this invitation, you're going to have to get a job to support yourself. But we really felt that that's where we were supposed to be. So uh, I wondered what kind of a job I would get that would give me the flexibility I would need from time to time as a pastor. And I found that the Salvation Army was looking for a kind of a flunky and just to do a variety of things. And so I went down and met with the captain and he was thrilled to get a Bible college graduate and hired me on the spot. Joyce was the bookkeeper. And uh, so we got to know each other and right around that very same time, Pam was born. And uh, so uh, I didn't get rich at that job, but it, uh, it paid the bills. And uh, getting to know Joyce uh, was special because uh, she was so rock solid in her faith, so genuine in her concern for people. And um, so sometime later, several years later, when, when Barbara passed away, a mutual friend who had, who had been the secretary um, at the Salvation Army started coming by and uh, saying, have, have you considered Joyce? <laughs> and I said, for what? And uh, she said, She's Bible college trained. She's a, she's a pro with children's ministry. She would be such a blessing in your life. I said, Joyce wouldn't give me the time of day. She just wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't be so sure. And anyway, Polly had been talking to her about a, a group of people going to a basketball game. And... Uh, of course, Joyce wanted to know who would be in that group. And so Joyce, uh, Polly mentioned several people and, and uh, finally said, you know, we ought, to, we ought to check on Leonard and make sure he's getting out and going ahead with his life. And Joyce said, well, that, that'd be okay. Well, this went on for months. I kept telling Polly, I'm not going to ask her out because she'll say no. Well, the straw that broke the camel's back was when Polly called me a coward and said, I don't know how you have the nerve to preach courage and boldness to your people. You won't even go and ask Joyce out. So anyway, I decided I'm going to get this over with. I'll go and ask her. She'll say no, and I'll call Polly and say, leave me alone. It was the hardest thing I ever did. I sat there feeling like I was cheating on Barbara. And still grieving and wounded. And, but uh, I finally said... Uh, I was wondering if you'd like to go to a basketball game on Friday night. And boy, she looked at me and didn't say a word. And I thought, you better say something. I don't know how long I can hold my breath. And finally she said, well, I think that would be fun. And I'm thinking, I think that was a yes. Well, we survived, we survived that night and when I took her home, I said, would it be okay if I call you again? And, and uh, she says, yeah, that'd be fine. I'm, I'm thinking she's just saying that to get rid of me. <laughs> but So a couple of weeks later, I called and I said, how would you like to go to another basketball game? The first one was a high school tournament. The second was the Glo Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> and she said, oh, I like that. Well, anyway... It wasn't so long that uh, it just all started coming together. And so the Lord gave us 56 amazing years. We were different. Uh, they say that opposites attract. And 
So if that's true, <laughs> we were a match like that. Uh, one example was, uh, I mean, Joyce was uh, very color conscious and and she said to me on more than one occasion, why do you wear so much brown? I said, because I like it. And she said, it's not your color. It just bleaches, it just bleaches the life out of your face. She said, blue is your color. And I said, well, that may be, but I like brown. But... Uh, Anyway, if we were going to some place that was important to her, I would usually wear what she thought was my color. One of the things I'll always cherish, especially the, I'd say the, the last six months, Joyce couldn't talk, and um, but now and again she would nod her head. And, but um, usually about nine o'clock, uh, the caregiver was getting ready to go to bed and the care we, get, we had two caregivers who were wonderful Christians and we, um, Rochelle, uh, she, she was hungry and thirsty for spiritual food and but uh, whenever she was on duty, uh, she wanted to be a part of our prayer time. Joyce might be restless, and, but I'd go over to her bedside and I'd chat with her for a minute and I'd say, uh, ready for prayer, just like that. She'd calm down and close her eyes. And, and all through the years, every, every night when we were in bed, We'd hold hands and pray together. And to see that, how important that was to her right to the very end. Psalm, Psalm 16, verse 11 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures for forevermore. I want to just share with you for a few minutes about Joyce's new home. Joyce's new home. Heaven is the home promised by Christ to all who receive him as Savior and Lord. We see that promise numerous times, but John 14, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In Acts chapter 1, we read about his ascension. The people were watching as he left the earth and was caught up and received out of their sight by the clouds. And uh, we read these words. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he was taken up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go. I love this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and in verse 1 where it says the day of one's death is better than the day of his birth. Not a great verse. The day of one's death is better than the day of his birth. And that just leads me to say, first of all, that heaven is a real place. It's not pie in the sky. It's not a figment of your imagination. 
Paul in Philippians uh, chapter 3 and verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you are a citizen of heaven. The Apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, says in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I wish I could say I've done that well with some of my investments. But think of this, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance, Peter says, is kept in heaven for you. So heaven is not only a real place, but heaven is a place of resplendent beauty. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is a, a place of unparalleled beauty. Just for an example, the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 18 talks about being caught up and was introduced to many of the wonders of heaven and he says in Revelation 21, its wall was of jasper and the city was of pure gold like clear glass. And I mean, that's, that's just a taste of it. But uh, the book of Revelation pulses with the way it describes the beauty and the glory of Joyce's new home. Uh, I don't know that Jesus will ask her to do any interior decorating. <laughs> I think it's all cared for. In many ways, heaven will be a place of rest and relief. Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for, well, in Philippians he wrote, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, he said that he was willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And for the believer, the moment you take your last breath, absent from the body, present with the Lord. The Bible says that in heaven there will be no more death, no more tears, no more mourning, and that's the grieving, no more crying, no more pain, no more for farewells, no more sorrow, nor, no more sin and wickedness, no more fear. There won't be any need for hospitals and nursing homes, no need for counseling centers, no need for funeral homes or cemeteries. No need for law enforcement or prison or courthouses. Anything that would rob you or me of our joy in this present world will be gone forever. Something else that I think is terrific is that heaven will be a place of recognition and reunion. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is responding to a concern that the believers in Thessalonica had about uh, what about our loved ones who have preceded us in death? What's, are they at a disadvantage? What, what about it? And so Paul explains what will happen when Christ returns. For... If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep or rest in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Only the body goes to sleep, absent from the body, present with the Lord. He goes on to say, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's going to be a bodily resurrection. Wow. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And I can only imagine what Joyce is experiencing being with her parents again, with her brother and his wife, Ken and Ethel, and just a multitude of people that uh, loved ones who've gone on ahead. Jesus took Peter and James and John with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. And while they, while they were there, they saw him transformed, uh, white as light in his countenance. But they saw Moses and Elijah appear and spend time with Jesus. No one had to introduce them. They had never met Moses and Elijah, but they recognized them. The Bible says that in heaven, we will know even as we are known. I believe that the day will come when I will meet Paul and no one will have to introduce us. Paul will say, Leonard, you made it. And I'll say, Paul, I, I just want to talk to you about the Damascus experience <laughs> when you were knocked off your horse and, and uh, heard that voice speaking to you. And by the time that was over, you were a solid Christ follower. I'd like to hear him describe that. And then finally, uh, heaven is a place of award and reward. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.31 challenges us in our present day living. He says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, he wrote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We are to abound in the work of the Lord. And we are told that when we do that, we will be rewarded uh, for that. The Bible repeatedly speaks of certain awards or rewards that will be given to believers in, in heaven. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, we read about a crown of righteousness that will be given to those who live godly lives and have loved his appearing. I think it was about three or four weeks uh, before the Lord called Joyce home. Uh, one evening, uh, she had been a little bit restless and so we were getting ready for our prayer time and, uh, and I said, Joyce, uh, uh, have you seen angels? And she nodded her head. And I said, uh, don't be afraid to go. Don't be afraid to go. It's okay. We'll be okay. But uh, maybe Jesus is getting ready for you to come on home. So he says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So a crown of righteousness will be given to those who live godly lives and have loved his appearing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we read of an incorruptible crown 
that will be presented to those who run the race and finish strongly in the Christian faith. I think of Paul when he was writing to Timothy and he, and he says, and I have kept the faith. And the faith that, is re, that he was referring to when he used that word faith was the body of doctrine, the body of truth that is what the Bible is all about. And that body of truth that he kept, kept him as well. In Revelation chapter 2, we read of the crown of life. It's also referred to as the martyr's crown. And it will be given to those who go through severe trials and even death on Christ's behalf. We read of the crown of rejoicing that will be given to those who have faithfully led people to trust in Christ. Read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, in, the, in the video that we showed earlier, it showed that Joyce was a lover of children and her passion was to see children uh, come to Christ. And dur during our years at Missionary Church, Venture Missionary, I was regularly baptizing uh, young children who had come up through the Sunday school ministry that she was over and uh, had accepted Christ as a result of that. And then lastly, we read of the crown of glory in First, in first Peter chapter 5, verse 4, a crown that will be given to faithful pastors and teachers who faithfully teach uh, God's word to others in truth and faithfulness. And uh, I can say, uh, I can say that all the years that we served together, she was faithful in her passion for the scriptures. Her Bible, her Bible is all marked up and falling apart. And uh, we talked about it, getting it re restored. But I, I checked around to see if I could find one just like it. And I did. It took a little while, but uh, uh, I found one just like it, except it, it had a thumb index. And uh, I was so excited to give that Bible to her and, and that she could start marking it up. But uh, it just wasn't like the Bible that she had used across the years and that Jim and Pam went through looking for things to share. So a crown of glory to faithful pastors and teachers who faithfully teach God's word to others. For the entire 56 years that we were married, uh, she was involved primarily in children's ministry, but a lot of people would not have known that uh, she had a significant telephone ministry, uh, especially to ladies. I don't know how many times I would come home towards the end of the day and, and she'd be on the phone and she would be listening and then I would hear her say, okay, this is what you need to do. And over the years, I had, I, I've had so many ladies say how much they appreciated that she would take the time to listen to them over the phone and then that she would guide them based on the Word of God and that she would pray with them. Uh, I, uh, I miss you, Joyce. But I am so glad that you are no longer battling poor health and I will join you in God's good time.
you'll join me in one final song. Bring praise to the Lord, how great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. That God, his son, not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, I burden gladly buried, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my sin. Your God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, it's been good to be in your presence today. As we remember the life and celebrate the life of Joyce DeWitt. All of us, Lord, here have been touched in some way, whether directly or indirectly, by her life. We just pray, Father, that as we celebrate her graduation into your presence, Lord, that we remember the things that we appreciate and cherish in her life. That, Lord, we would follow her example and be faithfully dedicated and obedient to you. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit but permeate our lives, Lord. Fill us up, Lord. Motivate us, encourage us to do your will, Lord, to build your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to be ever mindful of the fact that you love us and that you care for us, that you forgive us, that you've redeemed us, and that you are awaiting our arrival to spend eternity with you. 
Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be part of your family. Thank you, Lord, for our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.